Hello, everybody. It's Stephen and Walter here for this week's episode of So Chatty, and it's episode number 46. And today is February the 4th, 2022. So we're well into February, and supposedly the groundhog saw its shadow, I think, and so there's six more weeks of winter. Or is it, if he doesn't see a shadow, it means there's six That's more right, weeks before really spring. Hear what the news was on the ground. Huh? I didn't even know why. I don't know. I don't think it matters. No, it doesn't. But didn't you just hear what I said? <laughs> yeah. Six more. If he sees a shadow, six more weeks to of winter. If he doesn't see a shadow, six more weeks till spring. Do you see the flaw? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Apparently, Wyerton Willie, our little groundhog, you know, uh, up here, he's dead. Yeah, well, that in fact, matter. we're not sure what generation this Wyerton Willie is. They kept it a secret when the last one kicked Just off. find a new one to stick a pole up. Right? Well, the other thing is they keep them in a little plastic box, at yeah. least on display. Well, that's why he died. It's called, put a hole in this thing, you know? Oxygen, that's good for it. Now, I think there were holes in it. But anyway, so today, okay, right off the bat, we have a complaint. Here's the complaint. We don't know what we're going to talk about from one week to the next. If you notice, I yeah. often end the video saying, we don't know what we're going to talk about next. What are you going to say? Yeah, I know. Like, we're sitting here trying to figure out, okay, what can we talk about next? I have dreams about it that don't help me with the whole thing. I mean, we're kind of running out of topics to, to, unless we start repeating ourselves. But. Yeah, well, that's not unusual for us. But, I mean, we need some ideas, people. And those ideas have to come from you. Because if this is going to really work, the So Chatty, we want to make it relevant to you. To what you would find interesting. What you would find helpful. And that kind of thing. Now, we're not doing tutorials, okay? I can tell you that one, so don't ask. And there's a reason for that. A tutorial, to do it in one setting, would take us literally days upon days. And there'd be an awful lot of major editing to do for the whole thing. And my other feeling about doing tutorials about making quilts or making a garment is there is already thousands upon thousands of videos on YouTube that do exactly that. So why reinvent the wheel? But we do need topics that, you know, may not be as widespread out there, or you'd rather hear our particular take on something, you know, if that is if you're interested in our opinion or whatever. And we've always said this too from the beginning, we are not experts. We just tell you from our experience, that's all. We're always learning constantly. So please don't be shy. Brainstorm with yourself, throw them all down into our comment section or send me an email. The email address is in the show notes and we will put something together from your suggestions. We really need that. Otherwise, I think so chatty will have to die because, you know, because I also have to be careful. I do my vlog every week. I do the idiot quilter every week. We do so chatty and we do uh, Stephen and Walter live. And, you know, we don't want those to overlap too much. Occasionally, there is a little bit of overlap, but I try to avoid that when I'm planning things out. Um, so, you know, certain things that I talk about on the Idiot Quilter, we don't talk about here on the So Chatty, unless it's to update or to elaborate further on it, then it might be this uh, a similar topic. But I just don't want the same old, same old. You know, that's boring. It's, what was the point? So, you know, it takes time to watch our videos. It takes time to make our videos. So we want to make that time count. So really, please, seriously consider, you know, throwing out some topics for us uh, so we can keep So Chatty alive. So having said that, today is going to be more of what I would call a talking head. I know you think that all the time. Uh, presentation. When I was trying to figure out what we were going to talk about, I stumbled across, I put something into Google about quilts and quilting, seeing if I could find something I hadn't thought of before as a topic. And what amazed me, well, not amazed me, but what often comes up in Google is they have suggested questions around your topic. And if yeah, it comes up in a little box and there'll be five or six things in there. And if you click on the arrow beside it, it'll open up a little bit and gives you a little blurb about that. And below that is the actual web link that you can go to to get more information about that particular question. 
Well, I kind of went down the rabbit hole with this because as you click on these things, the list gets a little bit longer. That's how the Google alt algorithm works. And it's kind of interesting, you know, try it sometime. Put in a topic you're interested in and go to those and you're just going to see how many different um, tangents there are from that. So that's what I did. And it came up with all kinds of things. So I picked 22, no, 21, 21 of the most of the questions I think are most interesting. At least I found them interesting about quilts. Now, I'm not going to go into each one in detail. This is a, a, a bit of a taste. So you're going to get a little bit of information and there'll be a link as well. What is there a bird, something flying around? You're like, oh, oh, oh. I'm not meant to I'm trying challenged. to do, trying to sit here patiently listening to what you have to say. Well, you can jump in any time. Okay. And you will. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised you haven't at this point. Anyways, I'm just explaining the background for this. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've included in the show notes all the links to each one of these questions as well. So if you're interested in one of them or two of them, you can go to that link and get all the information you want about it. And you want to know something. As I was working through this uh, today, this is really interesting stuff. So how do I make something like that interesting to you as you watch this? Because this is a visual medium, right? And a lot of things we're talking about, it's text-based. So I found what I think are appropriate pictures to go along with each one of these topics. Uh, so you're not just staring at us, although we'll still be there because I'm doing it picture in picture. And uh, well, let's get right into that. So picture in picture, oops, that's what the list looks like. But that's not where I want it to go. <laughs> that's the one I want. Okay, so you can see us down here in the corner. And this has something to do with our first uh, question. And it was, what's the history of quilting? Well, <laughs> do a search just on that alone and you have stuff you can read for years and years and years. Now, just a little blurb about this that I found said, the history of quilting can be traced back at least to medieval times. The Victorian and Albert Museum has early examples of its in its collection from Europe, India, and the Far East. The word quilt linked to the Latin word calceta, meaning a bolster or cushion, seems to have first been used in England in the 13th century. So basically, I think what I found interesting about this is that we thought maybe that quilting was something that started in the 1800s or something like that, um, maybe even back as far as the Elizabeth's the first time. But no, it's much more ancient than that. In this picture that I found uh, is actually from the medieval times in around, I think this is uh, from the 12th century. So the 1100s or something like that. And um, I don't know if they called it quilting. I think they called it tapestry work because, you know, there's a lot of famous tapestries that mm -hmm. have in museums and they look like this. So I don't know. Did you think quilting went back to? I don't know. I would think as long as there's been cloth or whatever and people have used like blankets and things like yeah. that then um a form of quilting would, would yeah. maybe have started its roots i i would say well yeah i would think that's true i mean um, the quilts were very practical they kept you warm or you get uh i mean i don't know how far back you want to go but what about you know like little bits of cloth People didn't really know what to do with and sort of started attaching it together. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Actually, they have found a remnant of something they feel was a, a type of quilt in caves. Mm. Yeah, that date back to the cavemen kind of a thing. I read that in one of these articles, which I found quite fascinating. Not only that, but they found a piece, a fairly large piece that's thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of years. And it's been well preserved. You want to talk about good stitching. Now, I don't think, and I'd have to read more about this, I don't think it looks like what we think a quilt looks like. Like, no one was sitting there doing patchwork in cave times. They were stitching pelts of, of buffalo together. Yeah. <laughs> but in the Middle Ages, they were making clothing that was quilted. 
yeah. uh, for warmth, for one thing, and strength as well. And to wear underneath uh, armor and that give an extra level of protection, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the elements and, uh, you know, when someone's shooting an arrow at you or something too, maybe, uh, as well. So, I mean, quilting's been around a lot longer than we really yeah, and, think. Uh, well, cloth and looms and things like well, that. Yeah. yeah. And probably quilting is just an, a natural progression. If you're making cloth and you want something to be a little stronger, then wouldn't it be you'd reinforce it with some yeah. form of thread or stitching? So and that's basically yeah. what quilting is. So anyways, I found that interesting. And uh, there's the link in the show notes uh, for this. And if you want to read about the history, it, it is very, very interesting. So that brings up the next question. Where did quilts come from? And I have a slide for this. Does it come from the quilt tree? The quilt tree, yes. <laughs> now, this picture is in modern times. Yeah. But uh, apparently, this person that's making this quilt, he is doing it in what's more traditional. And I think this is somewhere in the Middle East or even in towards India. Because they, they're famous for tapestries and, you know, making carpets and making blankets and things like that. Like... Look at that one, the, the thickness of it. I mean, we'll come mm -hmm. later to another question that was there about, um, you know, uh, how what they use for bags. It almost looks like it's a mattress rather than... It does, quilt, yeah. but they call it a quilt. Well, it's all quilted. Yeah. It's a quilted mattress, maybe. But this is what uh, the answer was to where did quilts come from, or part of the answer. The origin of the term quilt is linked to the Latin word calcetta, meaning to a bolster or cushion. Well, you can see that in this picture. It looks more like a bunch mm -hmm. of cushions. Man, it's very cushy. Usage of the term seems to have first been used in England in the 13th century. However, the sewing techniques of piecing, applique, and quilting have been used for clothing and furnishings in diverse parts of the world for several millennium, and a wide range of quilting styles and techniques have uniquely evolved around the globe. The earliest known quilted garment is depicted on the carved ivory figure of a pharaoh dating from the ancient Egyptian First Dynasty, which is approximately 3400 BC. In 1924, archaeologists discovered a quilted floor covering in Mongolia, estimated to date back to 100 BC and 200 AD. And maybe that's what he's making, mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, prayer mats and mm -hmm. Middle East and that, you always associate they have rugs or they sit on cushions more so mm -hmm. on the floor. So that might be what that guy's mm -hmm. making. In Europe, quilting has been part of the needlework tradition from about the 5th century with early objects containing Egyptian cotton, which may indicate that Egyptian and Mediterranean trade provided a conduit for the technique. However, quilted objects were relatively rare in Europe until approximately the 12th century, when quilted bedding and other items appeared after the return of the Crusaders from the Middle East. So this little piece here, this little excerpt from a more, much more detailed document, is suggesting that quilting was going for many, many years more into the Middle Eastern countries before it hit like into Europe proper, you know, England, Germany, Scandinavian countries, things like that. So, um, you know, again, this is kind of dovetails in with the history business. It's not new. Quilting is no. an ancient art, really. Or like it's a refinement, or yeah, of of something that happened way before, and and as as time has progressed, it has evolved into something else. Yeah, and I think too it has evolved because of how the textile industry has yeah. evolved. Because look at the thickness of whatever he's sewing yeah. with, right there, and this is modern, and he's got a little piece of it sitting on the center, and it looks like we blew that up. Oops, it's almost more like a cord. Yeah. Than a thread. Yeah. But it probably has to be because this sucker's thick. Yeah. And well, I'm just looking yeah. at what's behind him. It looks like a mattress type of thing. Oh, yeah. And uh, that this almost looks like it's a topper for the mattress. Well, maybe it is. Well, when I found this picture, it was associated with the article, but they didn't really um, say what this picture was depicting. So, yeah, it could be that. Um. So, anyways, moving on. Another question that was related to this is who introduced quilts to North America? Let's go to the next slide. And uh, it says, when the Dutch and the English settlers introduced quilting to the United States, quilters maintained a practical approach to their craft. Since daily chores included spinning and weaving, there was little time left for quilting, much less artistic quilting. So they're suggesting that this came from the Dutch and the English. Now, the English 
I don't find that surprising. But the Dutch, I don't associate Dutch with quilting. So from your Dutch background, and when you went over to visit your grandparents, of course, at that point in time, you probably weren't interested in textiles. Yeah, no, I can't remember. Uh, my parents always had really heavy wool blankets and things mm -hmm. that they had, but uh, not so much uh, that I remember about quilting. But, you know, it could be more for the settlers because um, depending on what they had on hand, I would think that they were making quilts more for warmth. Well, yeah. You know, to, uh, well, it's something decorative, but also, uh, um, you know, taking what they had and making it into a form of blanket. Yeah. Well, that was the whole point of quilts, I think. Whereas it may not but... really have been practical in uh, Holland when it was uh, to do that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I really don't know what the history is in Holland of, of that. I just know that my mother always had really heavy duty um, woolen blankets. blankets. Yeah, we yeah. did too when I was growing up as a kid. We had a few quilts, but it was mostly woolen blankets. But you know what I think about with the Dutch? I mean, you've got uh, Van Gogh and is Rembrandt Brandt Dutch? Yeah. Yeah, Rembrandt. I mean, you've got some of the great artists of the world that come from, from Holland. And quilting is an art and like textile art. Mm -hmm. And the Dutch, didn't the Dutch also, aren't they famous for things like making, uh, doing lace and tat work? Yeah, like I think uh, there's like a lot of handiwork, hand work uh, in uh, lace and, and tatting and I guess and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but we didn't see, a, I don't remember, I don't but recall. I wasn't really looking for it when we went to Holland because I wasn't into this then at that point in time. Well, you know, the older order Dutch all had uh, like caps that they wore with, with lace around them and stuff mm. like that. So... Um, that sort of thing was popular. But, you know, I'd have to look into Dutch history to see if quilting was really something they did. Now, okay, the Amish that live in, you know, uh, in the United States that have a Dutch background and things like that. Now, they're famous. I thought the Amish was more German back Is it more German? Okay. Um, but I guess I'm thinking of what they call Pennsylvania Dutch. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, like I like I said, it may have become more of a North American thing, because uh, like uh, when I said woolen blankets in Holland, uh, there were a lot of sheep and things like that to make woolen blankets. Whereas uh, maybe that that material was not as readily available in the United States when they came over here, and so they basically took what they could get to make yeah. uh, bedding, or not just bedding to make what I, what I consider quilts are equivalent to blankets. Yeah. Well, it could be too. Well, I guess though, they, if you're hanging out with sheep, after a while you start to and, think about using the wool for things. So. I mean, it's not like living in, probably living in colonial America is stimulating for entertainment. Yeah. So uh, it may have become a form of entertainment as well. Oh, maybe. Well, it was a, it was definitely something that was tied into social as well as. But I don't know. I'm just guessing. Because yeah. Well, that's all we are doing from because, it. Because because I I actually I, I, now that you've mentioned it, I should actually do some history mm -hmm. on uh, quilting in Holland to see what see it what is. it's yeah. like. You know, because I think also we have a tendency to be North American uh, centric. Uh, and when we think of quilts, we think of them as something that comes from the United States, especially, mm -hmm. and, and that. But, you know, they had to come from somewhere else because they all came from somewhere else at one time. But we have this view that this is some this is primarily a North American art form. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it is. I mean, it is widespread in North America. I think it's probably more popular in North America right now or or. Um... It, I think it's sort of the, this form of quilting, like what you do, is more North American. But there are other places in the world that they do it. So yeah, and maybe it's maybe not so much as an art form as it is a, a necessity. Yeah, I don't know. So okay, so if you want to know more about that kind of thing, though, the link is there. There's a a very extensive article about it. So 
Another question that came up in Google is, what is the significance of quilts in history? Now, I picked this question because somebody asked me this a long time ago about doing something about the political and historical significance of quilts. And at the time, I thought, mm, that's a really big topic that needs a lot of research. And it's still a very big topic, and it certainly does need a lot of research because it's a legitimate topic. They do have political and historical relevance. But this is what I found. It says, quilts were made in those early days in America to serve a purpose, to provide warmth at night and to cover doors and windows to help reduce cold. Quilts were functional, with little time for women to create decorative quilts, which we were just talking about a moment ago. So what they go on in this article to talk about is if you examine the way quilts were used in the early colonial America times, I forgot to change my slide. Oh, there's a little one. Let's blow him up a little bit. If you look at the way quilts were used in the early colonial times, they were more Unitarian, um, as it says, for warmth in whatever form you needed your warmth. And there was very little time because they were trying to survive to make decorative quilts. So the decorative quilt, like the one that I have here up on the screen, that is something that came as life got easier in, you know, technology entered into life. It made things you used to have to do, like the wash, instead of taking it down to a stream, you could have a wash tub in your house and then running water and everything like that. So it gave people more leisure time. And when people have more leisure time, they tend to be more creative because they're not fighting for survival. So the next thing is then, which is one that I think is very, um, appropriate to today's quilting is what is the symbolism of a quilt? And the answer they gave is the quilts are pieces of living history, documents in fabric that chronicle the lives of the various generations and the trials such as war and poverty that they face. The quilts serve as a testament to a family history of pride and struggle. Now, you know, there's a lot of people make memory quilts. Now, uh, if someone in the family has, has passed away, they will take uh, pieces of their clothing and create a quilt out of it or the t-shirt quilts. You know, people have uh, t-shirts from concerts or events they went to and they save the t-shirt. Um, so they, you know, take those and make those into a quilt. So they become, I think they're the equivalent to a scrapbook in many ways. Mm -hmm. Other people incorporate pictures, family pictures, printed on fabric, incorporate that into quilts and things or like that. things that, items that are important to them. Yeah. And, and then there's the political movement, too. Like, one of the largest, I think it is the largest quilt in the world, is the AIDS quilt uh, that was started back in the 80s. And people are still contributing to that to this day. And I guess there are pictures you can find on the internet where they lay it out on, like, uh, in Washington, in whatever they call that, the mall or whatever yeah. it is. And it, it's just... It's, it's enormous. It's a literally city block's long and wide it's to re represent all the people that have passed away yeah. from from aids and it's memorial but it tells a story um as you read through it because there's people have embroidered or written into the the blocks that they've created or the quilt pieces they've created the history of these people so they won't be forgotten um what the times were like and things like that so really hanging on to a quilt uh within your own family if it has historical significance for your family and passing it on from generation to generation, I think that's a really good idea. And I think a lot of people make those kind of quilts as well. Um, so the next question came up, who originally made quilts? Well, I think this one, um, it depends on where you look on the internet for the answer. The immediate answer I got here was quilting originated in Sweden in the 15th century with heavily stitched and applique quilts made for very wealthy. These quilts created from silk, wool, and felt were intended to be both decorative and functional and were found in churches and homes and nobility. Well, you see, we've already talked about the history of quilts and they're saying 15th century Sweden is the originator, but we're seeing examples of quilts much older than that that come from the Middle Ages and go back into other countries like India, the Middle East, probably China as well, because. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of things have come out of China over the centuries and things like that. So I'm not sure where this particular article got its information 
from, but I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think it was invented or originated in Sweden uh, at all. I think the Swedish did their own version of it. Yeah, but... and maybe in Sweden it may have started. Yeah, the team. but, but um, yeah. yeah, I mean, so and that's the thing. I don't think that you can ever find a definitive record of like, okay, the first quilt was made by Miss Halcom. Yeah in 909 no, i think what it BC. was probably was a um uh you know something started out as something tiny like a small sample of something mm. and it has it just started to grow uh one person would say take it and then expand on it and, and things like that so mm. that eventually it all yeah it just eventually all went i'm just looking at this this quilt that's here that i found the picture of which was related to this article look at the top it's faded Mm. and the pattern the pattern does not match up it doesn't match up like it's like it's all just pieces of random cloth sewn together um and and it, uh, they have obviously tried to keep the pattern upright but... and i don't think it has really what we consider a real binding on it it looks like well it might be a binding it's very narrow binding yeah of some sort it almost looks like a pillow slip type yeah. thing or uh or it has a corded binding or yeah. something on it. Now, this might be an example. Again, you have to go to the article and see if they say much about it. I didn't look that deep in the art article, but I'm thinking this is made from leftover fabric from another project. Yeah. This is old, this quilt. This quilt was made in the uh, late 1800s, I think, or early 1800s uh, when I saw it on there. So probably leftover fabric from something, maybe an old pair of curtains yeah, or something or like that. Curtains or. or um... And there's or, a stain here yeah or it so, could be like a dress or something, or something like that yeah and it's just been repurposed, repurposed uh, material yeah which is an old concept but people do it now too they call it upscaling um people go to uh vintage stores and things or charity shops and they look for old quilts that might be you know been well worn that kind of thing that's why they're and they will cut up parts that they can reuse and resew and make them into a yeah. new thing i haven't got into that because i have a thing about touching other people's like in you know um i don't want to touch something that somebody else may have drooled all over but anyways uh what the next question is what is the oldest quilt this isn't it okay i just found some old girls sitting around at a quilting bee kind of a thing um the oldest surviving example of a quilted piece is a linen carpet found in Mongolian cave. This is what I was talking about. Dated to between 100 BCE and 200 CE. It is now kept at the St. Petersburg Department of the Russian Academy of Sciences archaeological section. Um, and it went on to talk more about old, really old quilts that have been found or quilted pieces. Uh, a lot of them are quilted clothing that they have found, but the same techniques are involved. Mm -hmm. And now, right now, it's on trend. Quilted mm -hmm. clothing is in. Mm -hmm. um, so that takes us to the uh, next question, which was, what are quilts uh, used for? Well, that's pretty much a, an obvious answer, I think. For centuries, quilts have been made primarily by women to keep their families warm during cold winter nights. At Quilting Bees, women had an opportunity to leave the house for a day, and quilt is a form of social gathering often completing a quilt in one or two days. We call those retreats now. The quilts could be for general use or set aside for a daughter's future wedding. Quilting still retains some of its solidary aspects, but has largely enjoyed a revival as the necessity of the past is now considered a hobby. However, the use of a quilt as an excuse for socialization has not ceased. So basically, we think of quilts for being on a bed. But... We also know quilts are used, or the technique of quilting used for making clothing. But I think what they're pointing out in this little excerpt here is that quilts are really a means for socializing. Because if you think of the old style quilting bees, the ladies would get together and uh, work around a big frame and quilt a big uh, quilt. Um, now we have I mean, the, the concept of a television is actually a pretty new concept yeah. still. The older days, uh, when my parents grew up in that, there were no televisions or radios no. or anything like that. As entertainment, you had, my mother always said that she had to do handiwork and stuff yeah. when she was at home. Uh, like, my mother knitted and uh, crocheted and uh, 
and uh, she was her mother said her to say well okay um, I don't want you reading a book all the time I want you to do something handy that's that's uh, beneficial to the household yeah well I think too um, girls were expected to learn to do needlework of yeah. some form and I'm wondering now I have no evidence of this but I'm just thinking about it they often had to make a sampler to practice mm -hmm. their stitches and things like that um, I wonder if they did quilting too to practice their stitching to learn a little Possibly. bit more about tech because when you make a quilt there's a lot of different types yeah. especially by hand uh different stitches that are, are needed to be done in it and that kind of thing um crazy quilts have a lot of decorative stitching on them so mm. um yeah it was considered women's work, yeah well like if you get and we went for a trip to italy many years ago and uh, wasn't there a, in italy um, the girls had to make uh, lace. Lace, yeah, the lace. Right? Whereas I could see Italy may not be as prone to be a quilting center because it's a warmer country. Yeah. You know, because yeah. quilts were always kind of what I could assume in North America were set for, uh, they used uh, things that were at hand to make the equivalent of a blanket, whereas maybe wool wasn't as prevalent or something. So mm. they used stuff for the center of it that would would kept people warm and they ended up using all kinds of probably all kinds of different things for so there would be an interesting exercise if you could find the statistics and have a map of the world and look at where the heaviest concentration of quilting is in the world and i'll bet you it's more in the colder climates than in the mm -hmm. warmer climates for obvious reasons mm -hmm. with it hmm interesting study i wonder if anybody's ever done a study like that that's something for google yeah okay so next one is what there what are the four types of quilts and it says here there are four basic types of quilting though there are all sorts of patterns that use more than one of these techniques four basic types of quilts are pieced applique paper pieced and english paper pieced so i think everybody is familiar with all four of these types whether or not you do them or not of course we all know what pieced is um, an applique is basically taking more intricate pieces of fabric uh, that can't be put together with squares mathematically and sewn together. They're sewn together. Paper pieced is a way to get really accurate and for odd shapes and things, especially in quilts, more accurate piecing. And then English paper piecing, um, which again is something that seems to be all the rage these days, and that's making like well, you can make any kind of shapes, but one of the most common they consider in English paper piecing is hexagons. And I've tried my hand at that, but that's more hand sewing, and I'm not good at hand sewing. So, what are tr what are traditional quilts? Okay, we hear this all the time, but they do define it. Because if you put a quilt in a show somewhere, there are different types or categories that your quilt has to be entered in. So you have to know what you've created. So a traditional quilt uses regularly repeating shapes and blocks based on a grid. And that's this one's an example of a traditional quilt. Traditional patchwork can be simple or complex, but is usually made up of many repetitions of the same block and orderly rows. These are frequently combined with uniform sashing between individual blocks and or borders all around. They rely heavily on symmetry in both the patchwork and the quilting. And I think everybody, when they first get into quilting, you don't immediately jump into a modern quilt. You pick something that's tried and true pattern to see if you're going to like doing this and if you can do it um, with it all. So, yeah, but that brings you to the question and you hear this all the time. What makes a modern quilt modern? Well, there's an example of a modern quilt. Now, I first looking like this and I didn't know anything about quilting, I go, well, that's a mess. That's, that's textile art, I guess, abstract, sort of. Well, they say here, modern quilts are primarily functional and inspired by modern design. Modern quilters work at a different styles and define modern quilting in different ways, but several characteristics often appear which may help identify a modern quilt. These include, but are not limited to, the use of bold colors and prints, high contrast and graphic areas of solid color, improvisational piecing, minimalism, expansive negative space, and alternate grid work modern traditionalism or the over that page uh, up 
update updating of classic quilt designs is often seen in modern quilting so what's modern quilting i say anything you want that doesn't follow the rules that isn't traditional what's modern mm -hmm. quilting not traditional because you know now i've heard people say it's it has only a very very little color in it and lots of negative space well this one's a modern quilt has lots of color it does have lots of negative space also another characteristic is uh a lot of straight line quilting and this one shows you that as well which i find boring um on this one i think a little well on this one it goes with it enhances it but to do it i think would be boring mm. um with it but i don't know i just saw a mistake in it what do you mean mistake? Or mistake? right here this line of quilting starts here doesn't go down all the way so does that matter no but i'm thinking Well, oh no, it does. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Yeah. So, so what? Well, I'm just saying it's inconsistent. Well, it's modern. Yeah, I guess it's modern. No, I guess. I guess that's that's true. I still think that was a mistake. They forgot. well, if you go down, if you go, let's say to this one, this line here goes all the way up to about there. Oh, I, I mean, I don't. Well, think I don't know. Maybe this, but okay, whatever. I guess there's no mistakes. That's another characteristic of modern quilting. There aren't any mistakes. <laughs> you can't make mistakes with a modern quilt. Okay, so uh, what are the oldest quilt patterns? The crazy quilt is probably the oldest of quilt patterns. Early quilters used any scrap or remnant available, regardless of its color, design, or fabric type. Worn out clothing, women's calico dresses, men's pants and shirts, household linens, and other oddly shaped fabric scraps were fitted and stitched together. The, re the result was a hodgepodge of color and a quilt with a story behind each scrap well i think everybody's kind of familiar with this design of a crazy quilt but i have seen especially victorians love to do crazy quilting and they would embed all kinds of embellishments in them beads and buttons and actual photographs like tin types and things they'd sew it right into the quilt i guess the quilt was meant to be on display not to be actually used mm. and you can see here that this one has done decorative stitching and i would say that's machine done mm -hmm. um and i have tried this actually mm -hmm. uh it's kind of fun to do and it's a chance for you to try it all your decorative stitches on a machine but i think it would also be great practice if you were trying to learn how to do hand embroidery as well because mm -hmm. it's crazy so if it doesn't come out perfect it doesn't matter mm -hmm. but um there's something appealing about a crazy quilt i think so then they get into, and I thought this was interesting because there's a lot of myths and legends around this next topic. And why did slaves make quilts? It says, when slaves made their escape, they used their memory of the quilts as a mnemonic device to guide them safely along their journey. And that brings up the next thing about what that code was. And, and the question was in Google, what was the quilt theory or the code? And this is, I found this, uh, shows different blocks. And these are blocks that most of us are very familiar with. Like, uh, that's a churn dash or monkey's ranch. Bear's paw, we know. The log cabin, everybody knows. Flying geese, everybody knows. The star-shaped tumbling blocks. But these supposedly are examples of some of the symbols that were made into quilts to indicate um, to runaway slaves where they could go where it was safe says a plantation seamstress would sew a sampler quilt containing different quilt patterns. Slaves would use the sampler to memorize the code. The seamstress then sewed 10 quilts, each composed of one of the code's patterns. The seamstress would hang the quilts in full view one at a time, allowing the slaves to reinforce their memory of the pattern and its associated meaning. When slaves made their escape, they used their memory of the quilts as a mnemonic, mnemonic device to guide them safely along their journey. The historians believe the first quilt the seamstress, seamstress would display had a wrench pattern. It meant gather your tools and get physically and mentally prepared to escape the plantation. The seamstress, seamstress would then hang a quilt with a wagon and wheel pattern. This pattern told slaves to pack their belongings because they were about to go on a long journey and etc. So it was their code. Now, although that sounds very believable, I read other things to say this is all myth, that this did not happen at all. Mm. Yes, slaves made quilts when they could, 
oftentimes slaves that was one of their duties if they were a household slave because for the same reason we've already said quilts were needed for warmth or things like that or decoration um slaves did a lot of the sewing that the lady of the house she might do fine sewing as an embroidery but everyday kind of sewing that was left to the slaves so it's not hard to believe that maybe they did create these these quilts for the underground railroad but others say nope that's all myth. That's mm. not true. And my point here is you'd like to believe that that was true. But realistically, when would a slave have time to make 10 quilts? Mm -hmm. Or was it a white person making uh, quilts that were helping with the Underground Railway? Maybe. I just don't see, not from what we've heard about slavery mm. anyways, that they would have any time and, and the materials yeah. to make a quilt. Now, they probably weren't extremely decorative and fine stitching because they were meant for a purpose. But I, mm. I think I would tend to lean to the to the point that maybe this has been over-exaggerated yeah. in here. I don't know. So that takes us to how were quilts made in the 1800s. And there's a little one. Let's blow it up a little bit more. This one came from about 1820. Um, it says, before 1800, quilts were made with two large sheets of fabric with a layer of cotton or wool padding between them. These whole cloth covers were then quilted. The two large sheets of fabric were fastened together with small stitches and an elaborate pattern of flowers or vines. So basically, earlier quilts weren't so much patchwork as they were just whole pieces of fabrics and you layered them so, and you used the quilting to hold them together and i suppose if you're going to take all that time to sew the two pieces together you might as well be decorative well, so that's it. more like what you get in the grow in the in walmart now yeah or something is two big pieces of fabric with some stitching on in between. yeah and they try to call that a quilt yeah yeah so it's not a new concept in a way yeah. so what was used for since they were layered quilts are all layered and they've got we know batting today and of course this is a modern picture of batting but what was used for batting in the old days? The type of batting used to make antique quilts has helped historians to establish the age of a quilt. Early quilts were usually made with handmade small bats from carded wool or carded cotton or wool. The bats were placed on the backing fabric and then the top was very carefully placed on top. These three layers needed to be closely hand quilted together. With this time intensive process, often when a quilt wore out, it was used as batting for another quilt. Wool blankets were also used as batting. Now, just recently, I've heard someone say that they used um, bed sheets for the backing of a quilt, and they used a, a wool blanket uh, in the middle as their batting uh, instead of, you know, buying actual batting. Mm -hmm. Now, I suppose if you want to make a quilt on the cheap side, if you could get an old wool blanket you had around the house or something, or you found a charity shop, maybe it had a few moth holes in it or something, or the the satin binding, if it had one of those, it's been torn off or something like that, or it's discolored. I suppose you could wash it up, throw it in. It would work as batting. Yeah, or even, you know, the cheaper blankets that you used to buy that were washable, they yeah. probably could use them in a pinch too, so. Yeah, so there's other things you can make them with. Um, I don't think I'd bother myself. No, but... not, not since uh, a batting uh, is relatively rel um, relatively easy to get. To get, and expense-wise. Right. And expense-wise, it probably doesn't cost you any more than buying a cheap blanket or something. Yeah, for that. But then again, if we look at it in the modern day and age of recycling and reusing, yeah, it might be a good method to use, you know, rather than throw that old wool blanket out that you know it looks a little bit worn stick it in as you're batting could work or you have an old comforter or something yeah. like that yeah you could do that too well you know wool batting to buy real wool batting 100 percent wool yeah. batting is very expensive yeah but they all say everybody says i've never tried it because uh, i don't know if i really want to spend that kind of money on that but people say it's very nice to work with mm -hmm. when you're quilting it makes your quilt lay really nice uh, and that whole bit. So, I mean, mm -hmm. a wool blanket. Except I think you'd want to use a washable wool blanket. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe you don't have to. No, wool shrinks. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you'd be have to be careful with what yeah. kind of uh, wool that you're using. 
for it. I mean, like my mom had these really heavy duty wool blankets that I feel so bad about getting rid of them, but at the time I didn't know what to do with them. But they were like heavy duty. They'd probably be worth money now. Yeah. But uh, heavy duty wool, you could not wash those. There was no, no way you could wash those because uh, they would drink. Yeah. And the wool might go a little funny on them too. Yeah. With it all. And when you're drying, it smells like a dead sheep. <laughs> <laughs> so how do quilts... Now, we mentioned this before about uh, uh, memorial quilts and things like that. And uh, how do quilts tell stories? And there's a whole movement of of art quilts, which are different from modern quilts. They're quilts that basically are fiber art, but often they tell a story or make a political statement or something like that. And uh, in this little uh, link that I found, it says, what is a story quilt? A story quilt is a material quilt with pictures, sounds, scents, and textures that are used to tell a story. You make a story quilt by hand, either on your own or with others, to tell a story of a moment, an event, a feeling that is important to you. Well, I think you can go beyond that definition of it, too. I think it's you can make it any way you want to, depending on the, what story you're kind of trying to tell. And now, and this is where you get into really what is textile art. Um, you know, it's, a, it's another level in quilting, because a lot of artists use um, paints right on their their fabric or they dye their own fabric for it or that kind of, i've seen i've seen uh episodes on the quilt show where they show using stencils and um paint or even uh markers or things like that uh to create an art quilt and oftentimes those artists are trying to tell a certain story or to get across a message a very specific message so it's more than just keeping your bed warm um what are some uses of quilts historically and today? Um, throughout history, it says women and sometimes men have used the art of quilting for many diverse purposes, to keep warm, to decorate their homes, to express their political views, to remember to love one, and all those things we've touched on already. But uh, I like the one about decorating your home with a quilt because, well, we've decorated my our house with a lot of quilts. And I really like making wall hangs. My whole problem is we don't have enough walls. <laughs> around so you got to swap them out or something like that and uh yeah but yeah so there's lots of things um and it says what some uses of quilts historically well i guess if you go back to the slave and the runaway the underground railroad and things like that that was a, a use of a quilt in a different format so lots of things so how many quilters are there in the world today i thought this was kind of interesting Throughout, uh, no, there are currently 10 to 12 million quilters, and the quilting market is expected to approach $5 billion by 2026 27. In 2020, there was more than 12% increase in the number of new quilters. The quilting market is expected to grow to $5 billion by 2026. And then in this little graph that I saw here, overview of time spent quilting. Um, and that's the number of people population so or no that's the number no how's that work i'm not sure what that number is i don't think i saw the legend on here mm -hmm. anyways a lot of time spent on quilting <laughs> according to this well you know i think too if they did a comparison to the number of quilters say in 2018 and how many quilters there are now in 2022 or 2021 Mm -hmm. I'll bet you the numbers increased greatly because everybody seemed to find quilting because of COVID. So if one of the good things that came out of COVID was people discovered a new art form. Or they discovered new hobbies. Yeah, well, way. yeah, in general. Not just quilting. Well, no, I mean, close. a lot of people went, went to making more uh, their own, baking more stuff or doing more things at home. Yeah, then. making sourdough bread starter. <laughs> yeah. Now we have sourdough bread that's overtaking the world. You see it coming out of people's windows and out of the backs of their cars and everything. So so we're talking here about the popularity of quilting and how many people do it. So the next question naturally that stems from that, if I can find the slide, is why did quilting become popular again? During the 1960s and the 1970s, women were trying to find their identities and express themselves like never before. There was a new interest in natural, organic living and handcrafted artwood. Insert hippie <laughs> here. 
Naturally, quilting once again gained a popular foothold. Because tastes were changing, the colors, patterns, and style changed as well. Interest in bolder, more vivid colors and unusual patterns that were more organic and free-flowing grew quickly and led to popular new patterns that were eye-popping and extremely personal. Today, many women learn how to quilt from friends and family again, often creating modern gifts, uh, quilts as gifts for special occasions such as weddings, retirements, and the birth of children. I have one little uh, exception to what that last sentence said. Many women learn to quilt from friends. Many men and women. I get tired of these articles that make this all about women. And everybody on here knows that. There are lots of men quilters um, out there. And it's not a new phenomenon with men either. It's just that it wasn't Men didn't come to the forefront about it because, you know, men, there's been men that knit, men who crochet and stuff, but they did it in the closet because it didn't seem manly to do. Well, that's all over with now, and it's uh, something that all men do. And I, these articles need to be updated, and they, you know, they need to include men in them or at least call them just quilters. So it's non, yeah. non uh, sex kind yeah. of identified. But, um, but nevertheless, yes, there are many women who are quilters, the majority still, but we're catching up. So, um, I think too, why quilting industry has grown is because of the new products. You know, I, I showed everybody back on the idiot quilter some time ago, the quilt that my grandmother had made for me and my reproduction of that quilt. She did it all by hand because she made it in the very early eighties, late seventies. No rotary cutter, all done with scissors, no quilting machines, no long arm. Well, there may have been long arms, but they were industrial and they were far and few between and the average person didn't have access to them. Not only that, the quality of the quilting cotton now is much better yeah. than it used to be in the 70s. Oh yeah, you can feel what my grandmother used and it definitely feels like it's a polyester, like yeah. a real poly a rayon or polyester, something like that in the quilt. And... People did there weren't quilt stores around yeah. like a lot of them. You just had fabric stores, and you know, they were geared towards the garment, yeah, sewers more than that. So, yeah, so now that there's all this stuff readily available, and so and the rulers and everything like that, my grandmother drew a grid on paper that she mounted on cut up cereal box cardboard to mm -hmm. make her templates. That she used scissors to cut it out. Mm -hmm. And I mean, she didn't even use graph paper. She drew the graph paper herself with a straight ruler. Mm -hmm. Like, and I don't know what she had. Well, she probably just used a straight ruler to draw a line on mm -hmm. the quilts. Mm -hmm. And she cut with the scissors. So, which I really admire because that's a lot. I think that takes a lot more skill than what we do today. I mean, ours are a skill, but ours are machine skills. Mm -hmm. more than anything i mean i would not be able to make a quilt if i didn't have a sewing machine or have a well she had a sewing machine but i wouldn't be able to make a quilt if i didn't have the rotary cutter and the uh, just, i'd be a mess mm -hmm. with all that so the last question came up was what makes a quilt valuable when determining the value of a quilt appraisers take several things into account for a modern quilt the internet can help you in determining the cost of thread fab fabric and batting the size of the quilt is very large and the amount of time to make blocks, the amount of cost of fabric and hand quilting all add to the value to reproduce it. The rarity of the pattern and what comparable quilts are currently selling for in the marketplace are also taken into account. So if you were an appraiser and there was a whole article about, a, you know, how you can get certified to be an appraiser of a quilt for the purposes of insurance or things like that, or, you know, if you're selling it, I think people maybe put too much thought into how much a quilt is worth in that way. I think what a quirt, 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 a quilt is worth is what it's worth to you, whether it's memories because you made a memory quilt, whether it's from something you learned how to do, the time you put into it, whether you made it for a special occasion. I think that's... The, also, the, the, I think it's like any kind of art form. Uh, uh, a uh, quilt is worth how much somebody's willing to pay for it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, there's artwork around that are worth millions and millions of dollars, but if you take a look at what it took to make that 
part work. It may not be worth very much in materials, but because somebody else is willing to pay that much yeah. for it, it becomes valuable. So yeah, um, it, it's hard to say how much a quilt is worth. You can say it's worth at least the amount of uh, the materials and, that are in it. So it should be worth at least that amount, right? Plus, of course, you might work in time that it takes to do that. But uh, but it's like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If some millionaire comes along and wants to spend a million dollars on your quilt, then... so suddenly your quilt becomes worth a million dollars. Yeah, I think it has to do with the the basic business principle: supply and demand as well. If there is a, a demand for it, mm -hmm. but there's a small supply, then the price is going to go up. Mm -hmm. Um. And right now, there is a demand for quilts because people are starting to understand. People who are non-quilters are starting to understand how much work there is in this because it's there's so much written about it. There's so many videos made about it and programs and things like that. And then shows like this picture is showing here. Mm -hmm. These giant shows that they run every year for it. Um, not all the people that come to those shows are quilters. Mm -hmm. They're there looking. And some people are coming to invest in a quilt especially the ones that win first prize mm -hmm. if they can get their hands on it um so i think it's the the principles of supply and demand like other things um as well but i don't know if, if my feeling is that most quil quilters don't make a quilt for the sake of earning money from it no because i don't think you'll ever earn enough no. because it takes too long yeah and if you can dance off a quilt that you're going to sell you're just like walmart I yeah. think because obviously I think the quality of the workmanship has to go downhill when you're you're if you're trying to make a business out of it. Now, yeah, me, like I mean, I don't think that you should make a quilt saying thinking it well, it's going to be worth millions of dollars. I think you need to make quilt well, because it's part of your hobby and it's something you want to do and you're looking forward to either learn a new technique. Or you're looking to uh, produce something unique for yourself yeah. or for someone else. Yeah. So really, the value of a quilt is the value it is to you, the creator, more than anything else, I think. Okay, so that was kind of long. Mm -hmm. Hope we didn't bore you to tears. Uh, I hope you found some of it interesting. But as I said, I have put in the show notes the links to all of this. Uh, that you can go to if you want to look into some of these topics in a little bit more detail. Um, it's a bit of a rabbit's uh, hole, I found, because uh, one thing leads to another, in it. and it is kind of, at least I found it actually quite fascinating when I was doing some of this research, and I'm just skimming the top of the surface here with that. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this episode of So Chatty, if you're still awake and still with us. Um, and uh, yeah, come on, people. Topics, get them in there. I want to see my comment or my mailbox uh, overflowing with ideas that's going to take us into the next year or longer. Please, 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 please. Or we'll be forced to bore you again. <laughs> Not with it. Anyways, hope you have a good week. And we'll see you, hopefully, for another episode of, of So Chatty next week. Say goodbye, Walter. Goodbye. <laughs>